we, we start noticing the attacks on young couples. She says, I've been raped, I've been stabbed, my boyfriend's been shot. Well, there was a tremendous amount of frustration. We knew we had at least nine homicides out there. We still had a living victim, maybe. Did we have the rape kit? Did we have the blood? Did we have anything? From the Crime Stories control room, the world's most complete vault of true crime interviews, this is Murder Time. Today, I'm pulling a story of two brothers. Brothers that kidnap. Brothers that rape. Brothers that kill. My story begins in Ohio during the cold winter of 1980. Homicide detective Tom Ross opens a missing persons case. A 12-year-old Toledo girl, Dawn Renee Bax, has vanished. Detective Ross. Dawn had uh, planned to meet with several friends over at Fat Daryl's. It was a kid's place, had a lot of games in it, and it was a hot spot for kids over in West Toledo. Uh, their parents would generally drop them off and uh, pick them up at the end of the night. But Don's parents are off to visit friends. They give Don permission to go, but with a strict curfew. Here's Don's mom, Sharon. Gave her the phone number, and I said, you have to be home at 1030, honey, because I thought, for a 12-year-old, late enough. She says, OK, mom. But when mom calls home at 1030, there's no answer. Don's parents go straight home. The house is empty. So then I start calling the other girls' home, and then when they said, well, the girls are here, I said, what happened to Dawn? Homicide detectives Tom Ross and Bill Adams begin reconstructing the evening's events. Here are Bill Adams, Tom Ross, and Luca County prosecutor Julia Bates. I went to the home and interviewed the parents, asked them whether she might be a runaway if she had any reason to run away. Well, there was a mix-up in how Dawn was going to get home. I believe that uh, she was to call her mother and or uh, uh, be provided a ride with one of her friend's parents. So they set off three girls walking home. Down Secor to Central, one cuts off, goes off in one direction, and then Dawn continues on by herself, in the dark, alone. In the dark, Detective Bill Adams retraces Dawn's route, step by step, along Secor, along Central. I then uh, drove and walked the most likely route that she would take in returning home. I would check alongside the road and uh, depressions and ditches. Dawn's family mobilizes friends and family. They search for the little girl. Called friends. I called her aunt to see if anybody had heard from her. My neighbors would look up and down the side streets and over by the creek and the overpass and by the university. Detectives Ross and Adams mobilize the entire police department. They know that every second counts and how their unit will react. When you get a 12-year-old reported missing and uh, there, there's absolutely no clue where this child might be, they work at about 24-7. They understand the family's anguish. Didn't eat, didn't sleep, just was in a daze. Four long days after 12-year-old Dawn Bax disappears, Toledo cops get a tip. The dispatcher's office received a telephone call anonymous caller stating that they were salvaging metal out of the old abandoned state theater and that they believed they had seen a body in the basement. Detective Bill Adams rolls up on a dilapidated, rotting building. I went in a side entrance, and uh, we went down below the stage. It's pitch black down there. If there's no lighting, uh, you just can't see where you're going. Guided by the beam of his flashlight, Adams moves methodically through the darkness. It was uh, like a maze down there, and 
we moved through these uh, separate rooms into this one room where the body was lying. It was a horrendous scene. The battered remains of Don Rene Bax are found in a pool of blood. Detective Ross. She was fully clothed. Uh, it appeared that uh, she had received a uh, terrible blunt blow to the head. The child has defensive wounds to her hands and fingernails, and the floor reveals bloody footprints. She appeared to be walking around the basement floor in circles for, for quite a time until I, I believe she finally collapsed from loss of blood and then the death blow was administered. You know, precious 12-year-old innocent. It was uh, just a, a wicked, wicked deed. The scene is carefully processed, but offers little. Toledo prosecutor Julia Bates. The problem is that this was a time before the advent of scientific technology that helps us solve crimes. So whether there was a fingerprint there or whether they were good at not leaving fingerprints, I can't say, but nothing was recovered. Dawn Bax is removed to the medical examiner's office. Her body tells a terrible tale. Tom Ross explains. The autopsy confirmed what we believed at the scene, that this child had been sexually assaulted and allowed to reclothe. And after she reclothed herself, she appeared to be in shock. She was tortured. She was brutalized. She was alive during some of this, and we know that because there were bloody footprints in the scene, and she was hit over the head with a pipe, and she was sodomized and raped and left there. The seasoned detectives are deeply shocked by the murder. They build a perpetrator's profile. The fact that she's 12 years old, had been sexually assaulted, uh, we knew at this point that we were dealing with some serious offenders here. Homicide Detective Adams breaks the news to Dawn's family. Bill Adams come to me and said, they found her. And I said, she's dead. I said, can I go to her? No. It had to be a closed casket. What starts as a missing persons case is now a kidnap, rape, and murder investigation. Detectives begin the hunt by poring over recent and violent assaults, searching for links. They take a closer look at the unsolved case of Sandra Pogorski and Thomas Gordon. Sandra Pogorski is a lovely 18-year-old girl, just graduated from high school. She had a boyfriend, Tom Gordon. They had become close, serious, planned to spend their life together. And uh, on a lovely spring, summer evening, they were enjoying each other's company when all of this happened. Sandy and Tom had been out on a date. They were parked out in front of Sandy's house. They're saying their good nights, they're kissing goodbye. And suddenly the passenger window is smashed out by a black male subject using a gun. Point the guns and said, get in the back seat. You know, don't look, don't look at us. She does look though, she looks and she sees a couple of things that were pertinent. As their abductors speed along a back road, Sandra spots a sign, one lane bridge. So they finally arrive at their destination out in the county. They overhear the two guys talking, what should we do, should we kill them? Tom Gordon jumps out of the car and runs for it. The young man doesn't get far. And he gets shot multiple times. And uh, they go get him and drag him back, throw him in the trunk. And now they take her out and they rape her, both of them, one and the other one. And then they put her back in the car. Now the perpetrators have a problem. Sandra can identify them. Their solution is predictable. Detective Ross. Uh, the thinner suspect now gets in the back seat with Sandra. The heavier suspect is driving. At this point, this thinner suspect pulls out what appears to be a carpenter saw, uh, similar to an ice pick, and begins stabbing Sandra in the chest. Uh, she knows she's hurt quite seriously. 
Uh, she can taste the blood in her mouth. Uh, she knows she's coughing up blood at this point, and she now feigns death. But with a collapsed lung, she has this terrible urge to cough. Uh, she explained to me she's never been in such pain in all her life. But she knows if she coughs, she's a dead girl. And she does everything she can do to keep quiet, to continue to feign death so that they won't continue to harm her and they won't hurt her any worse. And she's back there for what seems like an eternity until finally the car stops. She hears the suspects get out of the car and discuss the fact, are you sure she is dead? She thinks at this point they're going to come back and check on her. She holds her breath. Eventually, she hears them get into another vehicle and leave. The young woman escapes the car and drags herself to a nearby house. It's early in the morning. She's a, she's a frantic. She runs to the door, bangs on the door. People come to the door, open it up. There she is. She says, I've been raped. I've been stabbed. I've been punched. You know, my boyfriend's been shot. Homicide detective Tom Ross responds to the 1033. We were surprised uh, her presence of mind being everything she had just gone through. They come to the house, they see this girl that's uh, you know, stabbed and raped, and they go out and sort of retrace her steps. They locate the car, they pry open the trunk. And in the trunk is Thomas Gordon, dead from three small caliber bullets to the torso. Crime scene forensics process the car. Sandra provides a rape kit. She manages to tell Tom Ross they passed a one-lane bridge sign during the abduction. Joe Inman was with me. He was a deputy sheriff at one time. He's now a coroner's investigator. He says, Tom, there's only one one-lane bridge in western Lucas County, and I know where that's at. It's out on Rab Road. So we drove out to that location. We found the bridge. They found tire tracks. They followed the tire tracks into the cornfield. They found an area that was matted and, and trampled. You could tell that there had been some activity there, and they found blood. Well, we had the blood tested, and that did come back to Tom Gordon, the same blood type. We searched for shell casings, anything of that nature that would uh, be able to allow us to connect to a gun. But the killers are careful, methodical. No bullet casings are found. But they've made a mistake. They left a living witness. Prosecutor Julia Bates describes what Sandra can remember. So Sandra is the only witness, the only clue here. So we have to find out what does she know? What can she remember about the identity of these people? So she describes the perpetrators to the police artist. She talks about the cap and, and the little facial hair, a green army jacket, and this is the person that was stabbing her, so this is a person that she really got a good look at. And as terrible as Sandra's rape and attempted murder is, for the people of Toledo, things are about to get worse. But then the bloodbath started, and it was a very, very scary time here in Toledo. January of 1982 sees two more rape murders committed. Notable because the perps make victims reclothe after the rape and before killing them. It's become a trademark MO. There were more and more of these terrible serial killings, raping and killing of young uh, white couples throughout our community. It was frightening. As time goes on, we, we, we start noticing the attacks on young couples. And that was the biggest thing that jumped out at us. They were couples who were together, either dating, walking together. Doing what lovers do. Scott Moulton and Denise Siatkowski perish on the street outside an apartment building. Daryl Cole and Stacy Bolinick are beaten to death with a bat. The killers find creative ways to kill. They uh, changed their weapons of choice throughout these scenarios. They had guns at one time, they had a baseball bat once, once a metal tube, metal bludgeon, a strangling, all these different ways of uh, terminating life. 
or was it just a different method of torture? The killers leave no evidence at any crime scene, except corpses. Detective Tom Ross. We knew we were dealing with white victims and black suspects. I think that the investigators considered a racial motive because they knew that the two people that attacked Tom Gordon and Sandra Pogorski were in fact African American and that Tom and Sandra were white and then all of the victims that came after that, all the young couples that were parked in secluded environments, they were all white and they were all young. Investigators are stymied. Nine people have been violently killed. Leads fizzle. The city of Toledo is gripped by fear. That sent an incredible panic through the community. The cops are frustrated. Homicide detective Tom Ross. We weren't making any progress. We weren't getting a break in any of these crimes at the time. Investigators hope the perpetrators will slip up. And on September 18th, 1981, they do. So the Toledo police respond to a late night 911 call at an apartment complex. Officers discover two men lying in a parking lot. One is dead, the other critically injured. A third victim is nearby. They find a hysterical woman who said she also was almost killed. Police have been hunting a pair of perps, but this attack is committed by only one man, a young white couple. Todd Sabo and Leslie Sawicki are on a date. Leslie and I knew each other at Maumee High School, and uh, we were friends there, and um, actually we started a date on and off. I knew her father, Peter Sawicki, Leslie was heading to Ohio State University. It was her freshman year, and she was leaving the next day uh, for school. So we, we had a date that night, and I had to have her back by midnight. We were heading back, and it was about 11.30. And the moment I stepped out of the van, I heard someone's voice that said, get back in the van. And uh, I turned around to look, and there was a man holding a gun. Todd Sabo complies, and soon, finds himself tied up inside the van. Um, after uh, he bound me up, he told Leslie to go to the back of the van. He wasn't going to tie her up. That's when I knew that uh, what his intentions truly were. He had a gun on her in the back, and I was, you know, I felt helpless at that point. He, had, uh, he took her, her pants off, and um, I was, you know, pleading with him, I said, no, please don't do this. I just knew that I needed uh, to react. My anger, my frustration, my worry, it just all welled up and I just, I blew up. I went from being in the seat, bound up, to being on top of him with his gun. Todd shouts at Leslie to get out of the van. She ran actually to one of the doors uh, of the apartments and they, they let her in. Leslie calls police and then her father, Peter Sawicki. Todd continues fighting his assailant inside the van. I saw some headlights pull up. I was hoping it was the police, uh, but it wasn't. I saw it was Pete. Pete had got out of his car and he was yelling for Leslie and yelling my name. And I yelled to him that I was in, that I was in the van. After I got out of the van, I, I put him right back down on the ground. Todd has somehow got the perpetrator's gun. He tosses it, but not far enough. The struggle continues. You know, he pushed himself back to the point of you know, feeling for and finding the gun. The perp pulls the trigger. Todd takes a round in the head, blacks out, comes to, dazed sees Leslie's father bleeding out. Peter Sawicki has been murdered. Todd is rushed to the hospital. Well, so Todd Zabo pulled through. He was able to make a very good description of the perpetrator, maybe one of the best description that we had. Detective Tom Ross calls in a police artist. They put together a pretty decent sketch, and that sketch was released to news media for publication. 
I recall the juvenile detective at the time receiving a phone call from an attorney who represented a subject who believed he had information into the murder of uh, Peter Sawicki. He was married to the sister of a subject by the name of Anthony Cook. He believed that Anthony Cook was involved in this crime due to the fact that he had appeared badly beaten. Detectives waste no time. They roll up on Anthony Cook. Cook was a 32-year-old black male who lived in North Toledo. He was married to a school teacher. He drove truck, was in the scrap metal business. Tony was a bad guy. He was in and out of prison. He had quite a lengthy uh, rap sheet. Then, Ross discovers a critical link. We also learned that he had a younger 24-year-old brother by the name of Nathaniel. When they take him down, it's obvious Anthony Cook has been in a scrap. We then identified a confidant of his, somebody who was not involved in the actual crimes. The confidant is questioned. After initial denials, he's persuaded to tell investigators he was visited by Anthony Cook, Julia Bates. Anthony Cook came, he was beaten up. He said, I really screwed up. I got in a you know, big problem, I almost got killed. I just barely got away and you gotta hide this gun because I can't be caught with it. So uh, his buddy takes the gun and hides the gun. Investigators lean hard on the source. He finally leads them to where the piece is buried. And lo and behold, there it is. So now we have the gun. Now we have even a little more evidence about who did it. Somebody that knows what Anthony Cook looks like. We've got Tad Sable, who survived this terrible thing. We've got Leslie Sawicki, who survived. So this looks like this case is going to get solved. Victim Todd Sabo. I got a call from the police that said that Leslie and I needed to go down for a lineup. And as we were entering through the door of the lineup, um, I saw him. It was, uh, it, was, it was like a blueprint in my mind. I, there was no, it was as distinct as it could be. Cook gets 15 to life for the attempted rape of Leslie Sawicki, the attempted murder of Todd Sabo, and the second degree murder of Peter Sawicki. But he doesn't flip on brother Nathaniel. And he doesn't admit to any other crimes either. Well, there was a tremendous amount of frustration. We knew we had at least nine other homicides out there that were, we weren't able to close out. But we know there's a second guy involved, at least in, at least in one of these cases. We know that for sure. But 16 years pass as that second guy walks free and nine murders stubbornly stay unsolved. Police like Anthony and Nathaniel Cook for the killings of nine victims in a rape and murder spree, but they can't prove it. Detective Tom Ross. We felt that Tony Cook was a serial killer, uh, but we couldn't uh, uh, close out the other cases yet. We just didn't have the evidence. Cook is behind bars for just one murder. A massive murder spree has ceased. But criminal science is about to catch up with the Cook boys. Prosecutor Julia Bates has risen through the ranks. I become the prosecutor. I'm elected, I'm running the office, I'm in charge, I'm talking with other elected prosecutors, and we are talking about the use of DNA evidence in cases today in cold cases. DNA matching is still an emerging science, but for Julia Bates, it's the breakthrough that she needs. And three o'clock in the morning, I woke up, sat straight up in bed and thought, oh my gosh, we can use DNA to get the cooks. She recalls Detective Tom Ross and the homicide team. Uh, we welcomed her suggestion and we, and we uh, started to get right on it. Could we still find Sandra Pogorski? Because she was alive. I mean, she wasn't killed. We still had a living victim, maybe. Did we have the rape kit? Did we have the blood? Did we have anything? Investigators do locate Sandra Pogorski, survivor of one of the first attacks, and her rape kit is intact. It includes the DNA of both assailants. When she looks at a new photo lineup, 
Her ID is immediate. We said, Sandy, listen, you gave us a pretty vivid description of this suspect, the second suspect in the automobile. And we've got some new pictures. We'd like to show you a new photo array. Would you be willing to look at it? As she looks at this photo array, uh, we're watching her eyes as she's looking at this photo array, and her eyes went directly to that photo of Nathaniel Cook and never moved again. Not the kind of evidence they can take to court, but enough to get a warrant for Nathaniel Cook's DNA. If they can find him. We had problems locating Nathaniel. He flew so far under the radar, we were having troubles locating him. Uh, but finally, we located a telephone number for him. Uh, we informed him we had a search warrant, that we were taking him down to the Toledo Police Crime Lab, and that we were going to obtain DNA from him. This, this man became visibly shaken. Uh, I recall that he dropped his head uh, and that he just looked at the floor and uh, didn't respond to any more of our questions. One of the technicians uh, swabbed his cheek and removed blood. The DNA is a solid match. Both Anthony and Nathaniel Cook are on the hook for the crime. Sandra Pagorski is ready to testify. The case is airtight. Then, an 11th hour phone call to the prosecutor's office from the Cook's lawyer. It's like Friday and the trial's Monday. And the defense attorneys come to us and want to know if we would consider a plea. Cook Sr. makes an offer. Bates counters. He will plead to aggravated murder if you'll give the brother a little bit of a break. And then we said, well, OK, I'll tell you what, we'll consider it, but only if they tell us everything they did and they have to pass a polygraph. We'll consider it. And we have to make sure we have to talk to each and every one of the families to make sure that this is what they want to do. The families agree. They will hear Anthony Cook confess every one of the crimes committed against their loved ones. The plea agreement will limit Nathaniel Cook's time upriver to just 20 years. Ross puts Cook Sr. in the chair. We had uh, Anthony Cook brought over first. Uh, we sat in an interview room and we kind of let him run with it. Here's the police interview of Anthony Cook describing how he grabbed little Don Bax off a of Toledo street. So I passed the college facility, come into the housing it's right across from my and I wrapped around the neck, took it to the truck. Anthony picks up brother Nathaniel and they take the girl to the abandoned theater. There, she meets a terrible fate. I always said there's some good in everybody until this happened, and I thought how wrong I was. The violent, sadistic murders of Vicki Small, Connie Thompson, Thomas Gordon, Scott Moulton, Denise Sietkowski, Daryl Cole, Stacy Bolinek, Peter Sawicki, and Don Bax can finally be closed, thanks to DNA forensics. In the back of the courtroom are 30 or 40 people crying. They're all holding hands. They are fragile. They are close to each other. And they are connected to each other only by the fact that these two men raped and murdered their kids. Don Back's mother, Sharon. They plea bargained for their life. What if Don could have asked for one more day, another hour? I will never know how long they kept her, tortured, or raped her. When I think of Dawn now, to picture her as an adult, I think she would be very special to other people and helpful. She loved babies and animals and people in general. She would have been a good, productive person. As a convicted killer of nine victims, Anthony Cook is serving a life sentence at the Chillicothe Correctional Institute in Ross County, Ohio. Denied parole in 2015, he is expected to reapply in 2025. Nathaniel Cook was convicted of three murders, and as agreed to in the plea bargain, he was released from prison August 10th, 2018. Thanks for listening. See you next time 
for more murder time. Simon Decker wrote and produced Murder on Lover's Lane, working with files from the television series Crime Stories, Blood Lies and Alibis, and Catching Killers. Our executive producer is Ron Getz. Our supervising producer is Robert Laughlin, and our technical producer is Joe Watts. Murder Time is a production of Partners in Motion.